The mark of Cain is a biblical reference to a mark that God placed on Cain to both punish and protect him after Cain's betrayal of his brother Abel. Given Bobby and JR's relative positions in the storyline, you can see where this is going. Uh -huh. Punk Anderson is upset about the Takapa deal falling apart, thanks to Jock and Ray not being able to control their women. His words. Ray tells him to stop spouting off and focus on getting the state senate committee to vote their way. Bobby and Pam are still skirting around their marriage issues. Pam says that she'd like to put it all behind them. So after two thirds of the season has been spent hemming and hawing about backseating each other and teasing affairs, the solution is, eh, never mind. Compelling stuff there, totally worth it. Pam sees herself off, so Bobby butts into Ellie's business instead, telling her she should probably just back off and let Jock have his way for once. <coughs> it's clear that the problems between Jock and Ellie run deeper than Takapa, though. JR is still trying to get in touch with Leslie Stewart, but she's not taking his calls. Swellen is taking calls from Clint, though, and they make plans for another nooner. Well, I'm hungry already. Unsuccessful at trying to get Ellie to cave, Bobby tries to get Jock to call it off. Chuck says he's also given his word to his friends. So I guess it's a good old fashioned word off. Elsewhere, Donna has to answer to Ellie for not telling her about Jock and Ray's involvement in Takapa. And yeah, the more I think about it, the more that is a moral quandary. It's one thing if Donna and Ellie are just friends and Donna doesn't want to speak out of turn, but Donna has also been pushing Ellie along in the Takapa fight, knowing full well it's gonna hurt Jock. Ellie is pissy about Ray protecting Jock, but thinks it's not surprising now that he's a Ewing. Leslie shows up at Ewing Oil to offer her resignation, saying that she's totally failed in her mission. A desperate and horny JR doesn't want to accept it, though. I do love the little detail of Luella being jealous about the whole thing. Out of nowhere, Pamela's mother Rebecca drops in to see her. It turns out that Rebecca's husband Herbert passed away a few months ago. And with no other family except for her very mentally stable daughter Catherine, who is away at school, Rebecca has decided to move to Dallas. Pam is ecstatic, but she says that Cliff might be a tougher sell. Speaking of Cliff, he tells Bobby that he's been selected for the committee that will decide the fate of Takapa Lake. So now Bobby will have to choose between his mother and father. You know, unless he can come up with some creative third solution. Hell, there are other banks. Donna Krebs, ever the angel, advises Bobby to vote his conscience when it comes to the Takapa deal. At the ranch, JR promises Jock that he fired Leslie after the strip mining debacle. Jock wants the Ewings back in that cartel. During their lunch encounter, Clint can't shut up about how great it would have been if he and Sue Ellen had worked things out earlier and wound up married. In fact, now that he has money, he's never gonna leave her. Sue Ellen seems cool to the idea. Bobby shows up on Ray's doorstep and asks him to intervene with Jock and get him to back out of the Takapa deal. Ray says he's staying out of it altogether, with both Jock and Donna. I mean, yeah, except for being Jock's business partner in the deal and being married to Donna. But other than that, totally staying out of it. Bobby one-ups Ray's lack of self-reflection by accusing him of drawing a hard line on this by staying out of it. Yes. Ray is the unreasonable one for not intervening on Bobby's behalf with her father so that Bobby doesn't have a tough time at the office. Bobby accuses him of being too Ewingy. Well now, Bobby, you're just going to have to learn to live with that. At breakfast, Bobby tells the family that he has his first meeting in Austin, but he'll be back in time for dinner. I can only assume this means that he's taking the Ewing copter because that's like a three hour drive one way. Jock arrives for breakfast, which is Ellie's cue to leave, but Jock doesn't have time to deal with that because Leslie Stewart has left behind a little time bomb of a PR item. A full page announcement in all the major papers that Ewing Oil is opposed to strip mining and is entering the environmentalist game. We put preservation before profit. Strip mining rapes the land Ewing intends to preserve natural resources. Having been dealt a slap in the face with a policy announcement antithetical to his business practices and a gaggle of press who are grilling him on it, 
JR does the most JR Ewing thing ever and fully embraces it. Ewing oil stands for more than just profit. But to protect the environment, we are going to accept that loss and drill. The therapy, Sue Ellen says she wants to be loved by somebody. Dr. Elby points out that Clint is a married man, so he probably won't be able to offer much more than they already have. He wonders if that's maybe the appeal. Sue Ellen doesn't have to take a leap away from JR because Clint really isn't available. That's why whenever Clint starts a conversation about the future, Sue Ellen cuts him off. I don't want to talk about that anymore. LB also says Sue Ellen might be trying to punish herself by denying herself a chance to move on with her life. He thinks she might be trying to go back and recapture an opportunity she walked away from for JR, and it just doesn't work like that. Insightful stuff from the B-Boy this week. Elsewhere, Rebecca finds a nice apartment to settle into, but Pamela is wary when she asks about meeting Cliff. You might remember that Cliff threw up a brick wall, so Pamela kept Rebecca a secret from him. And it's clear he was resentful of her for leaving. And he was dedicated wholly to Digger. At Miss Young Dallas HQ, Lucy nervously tries to portray the perfect homemaker for the morning show camera crew. On a side note, familiar face of my youth Joel Brooks appears as the director. You probably know him from every television show ever, but most likely my sister Sam. Mitch is annoyed that he can't interrupt the shoot and looks like he's about to go full Steven Crowder on his wife, especially when the director calls him Mr. Ewing. I get that Mitch is salty that everything comes so easily to Lucy and he's the one that has to work really hard, but also, dude, just get out of the light. You're breaking the vibe on set. Elsewhere, Bobby Ewing takes his spot in the Texas Senate, which is presumably convening in someone's 1980s den. I guess they don't have much use for it when Gus isn't hosting a Super Bowl party. Senator Bobby rejects calls to recuse himself due to a conflict of interest and says that he promised to represent his district, and he's not going to shy away because it's uncomfortable for him. Um, that's not why they're asking, Bobbert. I'm not sure how or why he managed to make this all about his own feelings, but well, here we are. Bobby refuses to recuse himself even though the other senators lay out a clear case of conflict of interest to him. At Ewing Oil, Jordan Lee storms in and breaks things off between JR and the cartel again, this time thanks to the pro-environment ad Leslie planted. At the student union, Mitch overhears some horny goofballs, including future starfighter Lance Guest, slobbering all over Lucy's cover photo. I'm not sure what makes him angrier. The guys lusting over Lucy or the fact that they call him some med student she married. His impossibly attractive lab partner tells him to let it go, though. I know soap operas are built on conflict, but maybe give it a little time to establish Mitch and Lucy as a happy couple before you introduce the other woman? Mitch didn't want to get married, complain the whole time, and he's been a whiny Mitch ever since. It's boo-hoo, my apartment is too clean. Wah, I'm married to a gorgeous model. My wall is too small for my 50s, and my diamond shoes are too tight. Cliff tells Bobby that he has to stay on the committee to prove his ethics. And could you get a more ethical man to advise you? Bobby tells the committee that he's here to make the sacrifice in spite of the ethical implications of deciding the future of a project that could make his family very wealthy. But he thanks them for their concern over his feelings. At Leslie Stewart's apartment, Leslie tells JR she's leaving Dallas. But JR demands that she stay. In fact, he offers to set her up with her own PR firm. Ever the negotiator, Leslie comes back with a counter offer. She wants JR, but only if he leaves Sue Ellen. And we're out. This episode has some trashy goodness to it, I think accidentally. It definitely moves, and that's something I appreciate about the episode. Like the new Mrs. Ewing, things are happening to move the plot forward. How that happens and how dumb the content is, though, are two separate things. Let's start with the melodramatic title, implying that Bobby bears the mark of Cain because of his parents' issues. The Senate asks him to recuse himself, rightly, ethically, and he refuses because, I guess, these colors don't run? And then they just accept it and move on. At one point, another senator says it would be best for Bobby to ask the lieutenant governor to pick someone else for the committee, and Bobby looks at him like he just mortgaged South Fork. Say what? By the way, if Bobby had submitted a request to the lieutenant governor, 
he would have been submitting to Mark White, a Democrat who would become governor a few short years later. The governor at the time was William Clements, a Republican who broke a Democratic hold on the state that lasted over a century. And despite White and Ann Richards' reigns, Republicans really haven't looked back since. Crazy to think of Texas as a reliable Democratic stronghold, but things certainly do change. Anywho, the other Bobby nonsense is him making up with Pam, which is just the writer's way of admitting they really didn't have any ideas for how to resolve the conflict, and they wanted to move Pam onto her relationship with her mom. It's incredibly frustrating after watching the same fight play out for nearly 15 episodes, and then it just fizzles. But I'm happy we're moving on and Bobby and Pam will never have a stupid fight again. Someone who ironically doesn't have a hand in the Takapa deal or any other big deal at the moment is J.R., who is also agnostic about Sue Ellen's infidelity this go-round. The subtext of their relationship is really interesting because Sue Ellen wants to leave J.R. and it seems like J.R. would be fine with making the leap to Leslie, but both of them are bound in this relationship by John Ross III and Jock's patriarchal nonsense. I think that's what makes this season a bit clunky. JR is always the driving force with some sort of shady deal going on behind the scenes, but that happened a long time ago, and here he's mostly getting played by Leslie Stewart, and he's just kind of there until the end of the season. Also, considering the big reveal, Jock and Ellie were surprisingly muted this episode. Yes, Bobby tried to mend fences and it wasn't happening, but I expected a little more knockdown drag out. Fortunately, we'll be getting that over the next few episodes.